Maybe it's a computer and you, you're trying everything, it's not turning on. You're asking your, you know, you don't want to ask your kids, but you're trying to figure it out on your own. And it just isn't working. And then you call someone or you, you ask your, your kid to come in and say, what's wrong? I, I've tried everything. I pushed this button. I pushed these buttons. I looked it up on my phone. It's just, it's broken. And they walk over to the wall and pick up the plug and stick it in the outlet. And it works, right? How many, oh, I, won't, I won't make you raise your hand, but that's happened to you before. But if we're honest, it's probably at one point or another happened to us. That's the kind of empowerment that we're talking about. The, the, the type where without it, we can do nothing. Where when we are given this power, now we are able to accomplish what we want to do. But without it, it's, we are helpless. And so as we look at this beginning of the book of Acts, I'm excited to start. It's been a while now. But uh, when we first moved here, this was in 2021, the beginning, we were going through the book of Luke. How many of you remember Luke? All right, a few. And I loved going through the gospel of Luke and seeing the story of Jesus beginning with his birth and all the way up to his death and his resurrection and his ascension. And so that's where we ended in our study in the book of Luke. Now as we get into the book of Acts, this is picking up right where we left off. And it's actually the same author. So Luke wrote the book of Luke, and Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And so we're going to see a continued theme through this, this book. And so as we look at Acts, this is picking up where Luke left off in his gospel. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, the book of Acts is also the account of the work of the Holy Spirit in and through the church. The Gospel of Luke records what Jesus began both to do and teach in his human body, and the book of Acts tells us what Jesus continued to do and teach through his spiritual body, the church. That's us. That's you and me. And so this is the same story picking up right where Jesus left off. Acts is a continuation of the Gospel story and was written for the same purpose. We say, well, what is that purpose? If we look back at the book of Luke in chapter 1, Luke will tell us. He says in Luke 1, 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. He's writing to a man named Theophilus, and he, the, the Acts starts off that way too. In verse 1, it says, I wrote the first narrative, speaking of the gospel of Luke, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. So this was written so that this man's faith could be grounded, so that he could be instructed, so that he could know for certain the things about which he had been taught. And so that's my goal for, for myself, for us as a church, that as we continue through this book, that we can know for certainty the things that are written here in God's Word. Remember last week we talked about this. This that we have in the Bible is God's Word. It's inspired. We can read it and know it and we should desire that and it can change our lives. But as we look at the story of, of Christ as he was here on earth, but also his continued work through the Spirit in the church, I hope that we are grounded in truth. And so he mentions here, in verse 2, he says, until the day he was taken up. And he, he goes on in verse 3, he says, after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs. How many of you are, are people who like to proofs? What is proofs in geometry, right? We do geometry, proofs. But a lot of times when we hear something, my kids are like this. You know, if they hear something, they want me to prove it to them. And, I, and if we're honest with ourselves, we're a lot like that sometimes. And I think that's good. That when we look at something, we don't just say, okay, yeah, whatever, I believe that. We want it, it to be proved. And so we look at this, these convincing proof, proofs. As Luke writes this, he's given the idea that, that it involves conclusion. The word communicates evidence from which there is no getting away from. Strong, irrefutable proofs that what? 
Jesus is alive. He's risen. And so we see here, continued from the, the book of Luke, that Jesus had risen from the dead and he was with his disciples for, it says, 40 days there. He was with them, among them, talking to them, eating with them. And they saw that he was truly alive. And they recorded that. He went around and he saw many people. And so we see these irrefutable proofs, convincing proofs that Jesus is in fact alive. This shows to us the certainty of the resurrection. Everything that follows in this book, the next 28 chapters, hinges on this, that Jesus is alive. That he did rise from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14 says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. That's what he says. That if, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, if he did all these good things, taught all this good stuff, died on the cross for our sins and was buried in the tomb and he just stayed there, then our faith is in nothing. But because he rose from the dead, because he conquered death, this is the foundation for everything that we do. It's why we meet here today. This is why it's so important that we understand. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's an essential part of our salvation, our relationship with God. That Jesus is alive, that he has risen from the dead. As we look at this, these first few verses, we're going to look uh, from verse 1 until verse 14 in Acts chapter 1. And this is what I want us to see. We're going to walk through this together. But essentially, Christ followers, Christians, if you claim to know Christ as your Savior and have a relationship with Him, then we have been given supernatural power to accomplish a God-given mission together. Did you get that? There's three parts to that. I have that up on the screen if you'll look there. I highlighted them in red. It says, Christ followers have been given supernatural power to accomplish a God-given mission together. So the three words there are power, mission, and together. That's what we're going to look at this morning. First of all, I want to start in the middle there with mission. Our mission. Let's look at verse 8 together. One that you probably already know. But it says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's what we've titled this, this uh, sermon series in Acts, is to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth, and that's, that's really what our purpose is as a church. From the moment that the church was established, it's what we're going to see here in the weeks to come, up until us sitting here today, that is the, the purpose of the church, is to see that the gospel spreads to the ends of the earth. That's why we're here. This is our mission, and he uses the word in this, to be witnesses. To be witnesses. If you've grown up in the church or, or, or spent any time in, in Christianity, you've probably heard that word. When I talk to other people about the gospel, it's a, I'm witnessing to them. Or I, I can give my testimony. But if you've not been around the church, usually when you think of the word witness, you think of what, what scene? A courtroom, right? A courtroom, I call the next witness, and someone comes up and they give what? Their testimony. And so here it's kind of giving this idea that we are called to be witnesses. And this word witness is used 29 times in the book of Acts, either as, as a, a verb or a noun. We're going to see it a lot come up in this study, to be witnesses. We get this idea of in a courtroom when someone takes a stand and they are, are giving what, not what they think, not their opinion on things, but what they know to be true. What has happened to them or what they saw with their eyes. And they give an account of that to those that are listening. In fact, this word witness is the same word that we get our word martyr from. Right? That, I'd rather be called a witness than a martyr, right? A martyr is someone who, who takes their witness, their, their testimony, what they know to, and believe to be true, and sticks to it to the point of death. 
And here, even in this book, we're going to see that happen for some people. That they witnessed, they, to, they told others what they believed, even to the, though it cost them their lives. Luke 24, 46 through 48. This is what George read for us this morning. It says, he also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day in repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is what Jesus is telling his disciples. You saw all of this happen. Now I want you to go out and tell others. John 15, 27. Jesus speaking again. To his disciples, he said, you also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Our testimony. When we tell others about the gospel, really we are telling them about what God has done in our own lives. A lot of times, if you're, you're like me, and I, I assume many others, talking to somebody else about the gospel can make you a little bit nervous. How many people get a little bit nervous with that? All right. We're really good at coming up with excuses and not doing it. And I understand that. And I don't think that will ever go away. There's all reasons for that happening. We're afraid that what they might think of us, we're afraid how they might respond. They might think that we're weird because we believe this. There's so many reasons. One of the greatest reasons is, well, I don't really know what to say to them. And I would say this. The greatest method that we have of sharing the gospel with others is our own testimony. What God has done in and through us. Now for the disciples, this is what they had actually seen Jesus do and heard him say. You say, well, for me, I haven't seen that. So for us, it's different, but it is a testimony of what God has done in our own lives. If you know Jesus as your Savior, he has completely transformed you. He's changed you. You're a different person. We talked just a few weeks ago about how we've been given a new heart. This is what God has done in your life. Share that with other people. Tell them your story. Most of us can do that. And it can transform their lives as it has ours. Here, this is what the disciples have been waiting for, right? Right? Here, Jesus is talking to them, and at the end of verse 3, it says that for 40 days he's been speaking about the kingdom of God. He's been speaking about the kingdom of God. So here we see the kingdom come into this. It's in verse 3, and then also in verse 6. It said, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? When we went through the book of Luke, we talked about how the disciples were always asking this. They, they knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but in their minds, Jesus was going to come and he was going to wipe out the Romans, set everything right, establish his kingdom and rule. And as they started hanging out with Jesus, this didn't happen. In fact, Jesus was being persecuted by these people. And so he, they were just waiting for this moment where Jesus would rise, rise to the top and through military strength, just conquer everything. And so what happened when he was taken and hung on a cross and died? In that moment, we saw them. They all scattered. Their hopes were crushed. They thought, well, I guess we were wrong. What's happening? How can this be true? And so then imagine when Jesus rises from the dead and he's there again. They're like, okay, now's the time. This is even better than we thought. He died and then now he's back to life. He's really going to establish his kingdom. And so they're asking him these questions. This was their, their hope. But they don't get the answer that they're looking for. What does he say to them after that verse? In verse 7 he says, He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. And then he goes into, but you will receive power. And, and giving them their mission. He's saying, look, don't focus so much on the times and the periods of, of when this is going to happen, when this kingdom is going to come down. Focus on what I've called you to do. And then he, he ascends into heaven. He leaves them. They're probably thinking, wait, you were supposed to, to establish your kingdom and defeat 
the, the, our enemy here and set us up. But Jesus had a different plan. A better plan, as he always does. He tells his disciples and those that are following him, and he tells us, he says, I'm going to bring about the kingdom of God, not through military power, not through conquering these people around you, but through you, through me. This is how it's going to be accomplished. He says, don't worry about the timing, focus on the task. You see, too many Christians are sitting around just waiting for something to happen, either for God to come back or for things to get better, right? That world out there, man, it's just crazy right now. We're just going to hang out in our little group and wait till something gets better or wait till Jesus comes back and we don't have to deal with this anymore. That's not what we see here at the beginning of Acts. That's not what we see Jesus' final words to his disciples. He says the kingdom is going to come. He just spent 40 days talking to, to them about that. But as he goes, he says, it's going to come through you. I'm going to go. But it's going to come through you. And he's going to tell them how they do that in just a bit. But how many of us have that same mindset today? We're just, maybe it's not that we're looking forward to something happening. Maybe we're just so consumed with the here and now. Life. Life is good. My job is going well. I've got a great family. I enjoy doing these things, and I'm distracted from my actual mission that God has given me because of life. And I have no urgency to act on what he's called me to do. If I'm honest, I find myself here. We're just going through the motions instead of feeling this push, this urgency of what God has called us to. We are called to act. You know, if we've spent much time in the Bible, we know, you know, it's the book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, right? But it's kind of a weird name, isn't it? Acts, well, what does it mean? Acts of what? And so you probably see maybe in your Bible it says the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of different things. But this, the, the main primary word is act. It's an action. And that continues on for us today. I love here the description of the disciples in verses 9 through 11. Let's read that together. It says, after he had said this and answered them, he was taken up as they were watching. This is where Luke ended, Jesus taken up in his ascension. A cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven. So you can just imagine the scene here. They're talking with Jesus. They're like, okay, are we doing this now? And he gives them some instructions, and they're kind of like, what's going on? And then Jesus floats up into the sky. And they're just standing there. I, I would like to know how long they were just standing there. Probably a long time, just all looking up, nobody's saying anything. And I can't imagine the thoughts going through their head. Like, what do we do now? Even though Jesus told them clearly. The disciples, like us many times, were a little bit slow to catch on to things. So they're standing there thinking, what next? And then what does it say happened? It says they were standing there gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. These angels appeared. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. So they, they kind of snap them out, out of their trance of looking to heaven and say, look, don't worry about it. He's coming back. We have that same hope. Jesus will come again. But really, they're, they're saying, come on, you, you have work to do. You need to act. You can't just stand here waiting for him to come back. He has given you a mission and a purpose, and it's the same one that we have today. We may not have been standing there when Jesus went into heaven, but we could be here when he comes back. And there's always the question, what is he going to find us doing? And it's my hope that in my own life, in our church, that he finds us active, actively striving after the mission that he has given to us. That mission is, as we see here, to the ends of the earth. 
You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The second part of verse 8 gives us an outline of what we're going to encounter through the rest of the book, 28 chapters. It's an outline. We begin, as we get here, the church is going to be established in chapter 2 through Pentecost, and it begins to grow, and it grows in Jerusalem. And then later on, we have a group of chapters that are going to focus on its spreading to Judea and Samaria. And then in the final chapters, we see it spreading throughout the earth. And it continues to do that today. Some of the most exciting stories you read, even today, is of the gospel going into these places where the gospel has never been. When people hear the good news of Jesus Christ for the first time, it's an amazing thing. We as a church are part of that. This is what we're going to see. This is the story that we're going to trace throughout this study in the book of Acts. The church taking the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. See, this is a prediction, but also a command. You see how he says it there? It just states a fact. You, you, you're going to be my witnesses to all of these places. And the disciples are like, oh, okay, no. all right, I guess we're going to do this. But we know it. they viewed it as a command. Because we see later on in chapter 10, verse 42, it says, speaking of Jesus, the disciples are saying, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. And then we also see it, one of the most famous passages of our, our mission or our commission is Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Where he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always. What does he say? To the end of the age. We have been given this same mission. Wherever you are, you know, you may read that to the ends of the earth. And you say, well, I, I can't really do that. First of all, you can, right? But I realize this. God doesn't call everyone to go to the ends of the earth. Where even is that, right? The picture, rather, is of the gospel spreading everywhere. Wherever it is not, that's where we should want to take the gospel. You may not be able to go to a different country. We've been praying for Ioni. Notice she's not here this morning. She is in Paraguay for, uh, for an extended period of time. I think she gets back on the 21st. Um, and she's doing a missions trip. And she loves to do those. If you know her, she's, I think she has a few more planned after this. But I love how she prioritizes this. She loves going places and not just meeting physical needs, but meeting spiritual needs. And it's my desire for our church as we grow, that we go beyond just our little building here or, or even our small town of Lodi. And that we seek to impact to the ends of the earth. That we're involved in missions and that we are actively aware of what God is doing in places other than this. Heather and I were missionaries, so we have a heart for that. And I know many of you do too. But it's so exciting to see how the gospel is going into these places where it hasn't been before and people encountering Jesus and turning their lives over to him and seeing transformation and an explosion of churches and believers in places where there were none. That should excite you because that's this mission that we've been giving, being accomplished. And even if you can't go to these places, even if God hasn't called you to move to the ends of the earth, you can accomplish this mission here. Do not use that as an excuse. Well, you know, most people here know about Jesus. You know, Lodi is a unique place. Many people that you talk to here have had some background with Christianity. A lot of them grew up in church. A lot of them grew up in church and had a, maybe a bad experience and then left. Many of them think, oh, I know about the gospel, but have never really truly put their faith in Jesus Christ. This is our mission field that God has called me to, that God has called you to. You, know, you say, how do you know where God's called me? Well, you're living here, right? 
God's placed you here for a purpose, and he wants you to be actively going about the mission that he's called you to. We're going to carry on this theme throughout the book, so I'm not done. But I hope that through this study that we become a church that is actively involved in sharing the gospel here in Lodi and to the ends of the earth. That's my desire. I hope it's your desire as well. It's a big task. You might be asking, how do we do this? I'm glad you asked that. If I look at myself, I think, how could I, what can I do to really have an impact? Look at the, the billions of people out there that don't know Christ. How can I, what am I going to do? Even for us, our church, we're small. What impact can we have? The reality is that we can't have an impact by ourselves. Just like that computer that isn't plugged in, we don't have the power to do it. And in fact, if we try in our own power, we are going to fail miserably. But here's the hope that we have, and we find it in that same verse, verse 8, at the beginning. And so now we're going to look at our, our power. First we saw our mission, now we see our power. Our power is the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. So this is our source of power. This is how we accomplish our mission. And we must understand this, otherwise we have no hope of doing what God has called us to do. You see, this has been God's plan from the very beginning. Jesus' earthly ministry was complete, but now it continues with the Holy Spirit through the church, through you and me. God, Jesus continues his work through the Holy Spirit in you and me. You see, Jesus' followers knew that this was coming. He told his disciples that this would happen. But, but I don't really think they understood exactly what it meant. We have the benefit of reading how it happened, and we're going to see that in chapter 2, of what Jesus actually meant by this. But Jesus had told them when he was with them. Even before that, John the Baptist, in Luke 3.16, said, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I, is, than I am is coming. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He, speaking of Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus himself is with his disciples in John 14, and he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Jesus is telling them what's going to happen. That they are going to be filled with the Spirit, empowered with the Spirit. See, the church, you and me, whenever I say the church, I hope you know I'm not talking about this building. I'm thankful for this building that we have. But the church is me and you. It's us, and it goes beyond these walls to the many different congregations that are meeting around us. Our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are the church. And the church has power not from men, but from God. This is where we have power from, and I feel like so many churches today miss this point. So many churches today have been built on a person, find their strength from a person. And when that person falls, the church is gone. It's because they're, they're looking for their power and their strength in a place that cannot provide it. Zechariah 4, verse 6 says, so he answered me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by strength or by might, but by my spirit, a capital S, by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. How many times do we think, I can do this, I'm resting in my own strength, this is something that I have to fight every single day, and I, I imagine that it's true with you, even standing up here and preaching. It's easy to, to say, well, I can do this if I study enough and I get my notes out and I slide in some good illustrations and it's really going to make sense and people are going to listen and things will go fine. 
And it's easy to go through a whole week and get to before me coming up here and say, I'm resting in my own strength, what I can do. And it's my prayer that that doesn't happen, that when I stand up here, it's the power of the Spirit working through me. And it's the same for every one of us. When we wake up in the morning and we go about trying to, to accomplish the mission that God has given to us, we say, not by my own strength, but by the power of the Spirit who is in me, because that's what God has promised. Jesus left and went up into heaven. And he's there now at the right hand of God interceding for us. He's active. He's a part of this still. But he sent us to continue this mission that he started with the power of the Spirit in us, working through us. And it's only by his power that we can do it. See, we cannot do what God has called us to do as individuals or as the church if we are not empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know, it's funny, when you're working with kids, I know this is true about my kids, and they're trying to, to do something, maybe they're trying to open something or, or fix something, and they get to a certain age where they just want to do it themselves, right? And you're watching them, and, and they just can't get it, and they're struggling, and I'm sitting back watching, like they're never going to get this. They don't know how, I can see exactly what they need to do, but they're not getting it. And then you wait till they what? Turn around and say, Dad, I need help. And you go in and you do it, and they're amazed. Like, how did you do that? All they had to do was ask. And here, we have the power of the Spirit in us. When we get so wrapped up in trying to do it on our own, instead of looking to the power of God that lives in us, and we're missing the point, and we're going to be frustrated, or we're going to be discouraged. But when we allow the Spirit to work through us and we're trusting in His power, the things we can accomplish are far beyond what we can imagine. And guess what? When that happens, who gets the glory? God does, not me. Anything that happens in our church is because of God working in and through us as a, as a body. He gets the glory because it truly is his spirit at work. I love this, too, and we were just talking about this yesterday in our men's Bible study. This is a truth that has stuck with me wherever God's called us. Is that whatever God calls you to do, he will also give you the power to do it. It's a simple thought, but it's encouraging. Even with us moving here, coming to, to California, you know, I never heard of Lodi before. And it's a, it was a big move for us in coming in and taking on responsibility and saying, God, is this really where you want me? Can I handle this? Is this too much? And this is something that often came to my mind. The reality is, yes, it is too much for me. Not that you guys are too much. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but any, any of us accomplishing what God calls us to do, it's too much for us. And we need to get to a point where we realize that if we're going to turn and say, God, I need your help. And we can rest knowing this, that if God has called us to something, that he will Give us the power to accomplish it. He will. And so if we have already established that every one of us who claims to be a follower of Jesus has been called to this mission. To share the gospel. Then you can guarantee that the spirit of God in you will give you the power you need to do that. So when we refuse to do it, it's not that we can't. It's that we're choosing not to. God will give us the power we need to accomplish what he has called us to do. So we've seen our mission. We've seen the power that we have to accomplish that mission. It's not our own. It's from God. Now we're going to look at our team. All right. How many of you have played sports at one point in your life? Right. Okay. A lot. So we know this. There's individual sports and there's team sports. I, I mostly played team sports. But what's the phrase that, that they always say, there's no what in team? There's no I in team. And then you, you can answer, well, there is a win, right? There, there's always some smart person who says that. There's no I in team. This is not something I do on my own. And thankfully so. I, I do not pursue this mission on my own. And we see that in verses 12 through 14. Let's read that together. After these 
angels have, have come next to the, the disciples and said, snap out of it, get to work, right? He's coming back, but you have something you need to do while he's away. After that happened, it says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. An interesting little thing, a Sabbath day journey. It's not a regular day journey, all right? It's how far they could travel on the Sabbath, which is, they say, about 3,000 feet. So it wasn't that far. So about a half a mile. So they're, they're walking right from the Mount of Olives where Jesus was taken up right into the city of Jerusalem. And it says there, uh, in verse 13, when they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They all were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So here they snap out of it. They go back to Jerusalem. And what do we see them do? First of all, we see the unity. They're, they are unified. And, and this is a group that we, we find in the next verse, what we'll get to next week, verse 15. It's about 120 people. It's a big group. All right, and you know that if you get 120 people together, if you get five people together, uh, over a little bit of time, there's probably going to be some tension, right? But these people were unified. And imagine, just, just think of what has happened up until this time. All the, the, the things surrounding Jesus' arrest and his crucifixion and people leaving Jesus and denying him and the, the blame that could be going around and saying, you did this or you did this. But what do we see here? We see unity. Why? Because they have a common mission and a purpose. And they realize that they are in this together. They can set aside frustrations and differences and be unified in accomplishing this. They go from, from seeing Jesus ascend into heaven and they meet in this room. And, and, and at the end of Luke, like George read this, this morning, it says they also went to the temple and worshipped, praising God. I believe here that this is really the beginnings of the church that we see. As they left where Jesus had gone up into heaven and gathered together, they're praying, they're worshipping, they're meeting together. And this is the beginning of it all. And it's an amazing thing to see. But there was unity. Unity around a common mission. They were also unified in prayer. These men and women, about 120 of them, knew that they could not do this alone. They needed God's help. They were most likely, during this time, part of their prayer was probably for the Spirit to come. They said, Jesus said, the Spirit is going to come. They are probably praying, God, please send it. This is a prayer that, amazingly, we do not need to pray today. Because when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, he tells us the Spirit lives within us. We have the Spirit. You have the Spirit in you if you place your faith and trust in Jesus. We don't have to pray, God, send me your Spirit. It's there. It's in you. It's working. It's powerful. But we must be in prayer for the Spirit to work in and through us for his work in the lives of those around us who we're sharing the gospel with for the strength to do what he's commanded us to do and to follow his leading you know there's nothing more that I've found that unifies people than praying together I love praying when we meet it's an important part of what we do unifies us because it shows us our common mission. We also see our team, the church. You can look around. This is your team, right? You're stuck with us. <laughs> and it goes beyond just our walls, but Christians in, a, in general, but there is something special and purposeful about a local church. Us, this body of believers working together. And it's necessary so not only is there a need for unity, but this church is necessary. And I think we need to say that today. Obviously, if you're here, you understand that there's some importance to this gathering. But I can't tell you how many people I talk to that say, I just have my relationship with God and I'm good. 
A lot of times they've been to church before and they've been burned. Something bad has happened and I, and I sympathize with that. But we cannot be followers of Christ on our own without the church. You say, well, what if you're on an island and there's no church? Okay, when that happens to you, let me know. Then we can talk about it again. But too often we make excuses and say, I don't need the church just me and God, I read my Bible, I, I, I have my relationship with Him, and I'm good. It's common today. But I hope as we study the book of Acts, and even in this, these first few verses, we see that that's not true. It can't happen. God designed us for community, and His mission was given to the church. We accomplish this together, that last word. We've been empowered for a mission together. We must do it together. You cannot do what God has called you to do without the church. Say, well, Reed, you're a pastor. It's your job. You have to say that. I'm not saying it. Scripture says that. Jesus taught it. Paul taught it. We see it all throughout. The importance of church, and not just the universal church, but the local body. And that's what we're going to trace, and I'm excited about it. The growth of local bodies starting in Jerusalem and spreading to this day, Lodi, California, we meet here because of what happened in these coming chapters. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And in Galatians, just several months ago, we talked about the importance of the body of Christ in the local church. And one of our primary reasons for church is that together we can accomplish so much more than we can as individuals. This is our hope. This is our team. We're in this together. My prayer for us as a body of Christ is to be unified. There are so many things, and to be honest, really silly things that divide churches. Probably at some point in your life you've been a part of a church split, or heard about one, or been affected by it in some way. And it's a sad reality that we see because we are sinful people. But my prayer is that as we grow, God brings unity, more and more unity. Because we're unified around a purpose, we can have differences. We talk about things like, like music and the color of the carpet and the, the way we do this or that. And we're all going to have different opinions. But we're unified just like these believers were after Jesus left around our mission and our purpose. And we get to do that together. And it's exciting. I love it. I love my job. I do. And my prayer is that we are a unified body of believers. So as we end this morning, I, I'm really excited to get into the study of the book of Acts. I hope you are as well. It's a story of the beginning of the growth of the church. It focuses on key individuals. We're going to see this in this process, primarily the apostles, but not only them. We see others in this story. But really, it's the story of the Holy Spirit. So when we look back at Acts, why is it called Acts? Maybe your Bible just says the Acts of the Apostles. But really, the full title is the Acts of the Apostles as they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Really, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through men and women like you and like me, who without the Spirit's power are incapable of accomplishing it. But because the Spirit is working in and through them, God does amazing things. We're going to see that. Acts is a story of how God uses ordinary people in an extraordinary way to accomplish the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. And I pray that it challenges us and motivates us to continue this mission today. So we end with, so what? What does this mean for us? This book written a long time ago, and it's history nonetheless, all right? We're getting into a narrative. I know I love history, but I understand there are some people who despise history, who do not like it. Maybe you had a bad history teacher when you were younger. I love history, but this is a history of the church. But I pray that it inspires us and it shows us how we are continuing this mission in this world and what God has called us to. So we understand we are the church. This is our mission, number one. We have a mission from God. Two, we have been empowered by the Spirit. And then finally, we are called to do this together. 
you and me, together working for God's purpose in our lives through the church and the power of the Spirit. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of what you're doing in this world. Lord, I know that it can be overwhelming. We look outside these walls at the craziness that we see around us. And it's overwhelming at times. But I pray that as we study the beginning and the growth of the church here in the book of Acts, that we would be motivated and challenged to be a church that is pursuing the mission that you have given to us. To be a church that is confident in the power that does not come through our own strength, but through the power of the Spirit in us. God, I pray that you would lead and guide us and strengthen us and unify us as a body so that we can accomplish things far beyond what we can even imagine. God, I pray that you would do that. That you would work in and through us far beyond we could imagine, what we could imagine. And we ask that we would give you all of the praise for it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.